Amen. First Peter chapter five. First Peter chapter five, if you turn there with me. It says this. First Peter chapter five. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being and samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after that ye have suffered a little while, excuse me, after that ye have suffered a while, Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I'd like to preach you a message this evening on that phrase in verse 4. Ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. A crown of glory. Crown of glory. Now there's several different crowns mentioned in Scripture. By my count, there's three that are mentioned in the Scripture. I know some people will say five. I'm not going to give them a hard time. I don't think so. I think it's three. That's just the way I read the Scriptures. There's one mentioned by Paul in the book of 2 Timothy. That is what he calls the crown of righteousness. And this is a crown that is given for those who love the appearing of Jesus Christ meaning they're acting right as it comes close to his, his coming. And when he comes, they're not ashamed. They love his appearing. And it's the crown of righteousness. Then, both James and the Apostle John mention the crown of life. This is in the book of James and in the book of Revelation. There's the crown of life that is said to be given for those people who... Uh, endured suffering and persecution. They gave their lives for Christ and they're rewarded with the crown of life. Those who, who live righteously for Christ are, re- are given the crown of righteousness. And here is the third crown, the crown of glory. The crown of glory. This, it says, is a glory that fadeth not away. And I'm not, I'm not quite at the age where I can fully appreciate this. But I'm at an age where I'm beginning to appreciate how fast glory fades away. <laughs> I remember, you know, when you're, when you're younger, the way you look is so important. And when you get a little older, boy, that glory fades away pretty fast. <laughs> what happened to that glory, right? Um, you know, you, you're typically more athletic when you're younger than... You get a little older and you start saying, boy, that glory really faded away pretty fast. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that most of us, most likely all of us, within a hundred years of our death, will not be remembered on this earth at all, period. Nobody will remember a thing that we did. And if you happen to be the exception where somebody does happen to remember something that you did, you know, you do some thing that's recorded in history books. It's got to be written down or they would forget it. And even then, they're only going to remember one or two things that you did. They're not going to remember 
the majority of things that you lived your life for. You know, all of the glory that we accumulate here on earth, it just fades away. But here is said a, a crown of glory that, that doesn't fade away. It, this, is, this is permanent. Even after the world itself and every history book has been burned and is gone, this crown remains. This glory remains. This is not like the glory that we get on earth. And he's making a, a stark contrast here. But I want to show you what, what this scripture says about this crown because as, as I've studied this passage, I'm torn apart in my own heart um, about the truth that is commanded from us here. Look at what it says in the beginning. First we see the humility of the shepherd. And that, by that I mean the elders, the shepherds. He says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So Peter is writing, and he's speaking to these pastors. And he's speaking actually to a group of, of Hebrew Christians from different cities, from different places, and he's now addressing specifically the pastors um, of, these, of these churches. And he says, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. He says he classifies himself as an elder. He's a pastor. He said, I'm, a, I'm also an elder. I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ, he says. He's an apostle. He was actually there to see Jesus and to see the ministry of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So he, two of those things would apply to all of the elders, right? We're all partake, all Christians are partakers of the glory that shall be revealed. And that way he's identifying with every Christian. The glory, we will one day receive glorified bodies. And he mentions this concept of glory both at the beginning and the ending and all through the midst of this, of this chapter very interesting the way that he uses the word glory, and I'll, we'll discuss that in a moment. But he's saying, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm partaker of what we're all going to get. We're all going to receive glorified bodies. I'm an elder, so I can identify with those who I'm speaking to specifically at first here in this passage. And then thirdly, I am an apostle. I, I, I witnessed the actual sufferings of Christ. I actually witnessed uh, the ministry of Jesus Christ. And he says, because of this, I'm asking you, the elders, Number one, to feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight uh, thereof. Now, it's interesting, when you study Scripture, you only see the word pastor used of, of the position of pastor really only one time in Scripture. It's not actually the common word used. They will typically use the word elder. Now, the word elder just means they're... They have seniority, they have experience, and are able to lead. The word pastor means keeping a flock, a shepherd, feeding the flock. And then there's another word, there's a third word that's used for this. It's bishop, and the word bishop means to oversee. And here we see that he's really using all three words to describe this position. He's saying, to all the elders, I want you to feed the flock and to take the oversight. So all three of these are, are wrapped up in this. Now, some people will say that there is, in, in some places in the Bible, there are multiple elders in, in one church in, in the Bible. And that actually seems to be actually the case. In some places, they would refer to the elders of one church as if there were plural elders. But they never say the bishops of one church or the pastors of one church. And so I think that what, uh, what we find in Scripture is that oftentimes they would, they would have a, a single pastor who would sort of lead the church, and then they would also have people who would come alongside of the pastor and perform a lot of the pastoral duties to help that pastor if it was a larger church. And in this case, that would be Brother Drew and myself. We would classify in that, but we would not, be, we would not classify as the, that oversight, right? That, uh, that bishop, right? That in-charge pastor. And we know this because... In Revelation chapter 1, Jesus is seen with, with candlesticks that represent the churches, and in his hands are seven stars, and we're told that those seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And he's going to write, he's going to tell John to write letters 
to the angels, specifically to the angels of these churches. Now, John's not writing a letter to spiritual angels like, you know, these heavenly beings. No, he's writing to pastors, and the pastors are called angels there. The word angel just means messenger, so that works out pretty well. So we know that, it, that the way the Lord sees the church, there's one man that he, that he has as this leader, right? And, and there, there may be multiple people who help him with that task. There may be multiple elders that are underneath him, right? right? Multiple uh, assistant pastors, as we would call them today, or, or assistants to the pastor, however you'd like to say it. But those are, those are just subsets. What he's talking about now is that, that head guy in the church, right? That, that man who, who God has, has placed in that position to lead the church. Here is the elder who's also the pastor, who's also taking the oversight, the bishop. He's, he's all three. He, he's the one in charge, right? And this man, he says, he says to him, feed the flock of God. Now, this is... As, as I mentioned, this is the humility of the shepherd. Because here's, here's a man who's going to lead. He's going to lead a group of people. And he's, he's told, first off, what I want you to do is feed the flock. Your job is to feed the flock. Now, this may be a little lost on us, but in, in Middle Eastern times, ancient Middle Eastern times, the most glory-less position you could have would be to be a shepherd, to feed a flock. And really, the only reason that you would ever do it would be because you're going to make good money from it, or, and you're really just in it for the money, or you would do it because you just have no other options. You, you have to, right? You have no choice. You were raised in it. Your dad makes you do it, whatever, you know? Um, nobody really wanted to be a shepherd. It wasn't, it wasn't this position of, of, of glory and, and prestige, these guys were just out in the fields all day that nobody ever saw them. They came in every now and then. And they stunk like, like sheep, you know. And, uh, you know, this was, not, this was not the glory position. And so when he says this to the elders, he's, he's, really, he's really saying, here's your job, elders. There's going to be some humility here. He watches out for people, and then he lives it out in his life, and people follow or they don't. It's not the pastor's responsibility to make everybody follow. Now, this is a wonderful thing because we have our, our fourth, I believe it's four, right? Four year anniversary of our pastor coming up on Sunday. And I'm just so grateful to God that we have a first Peter five pastor. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with our pastor where he, he was explaining to me what's going on. And some, some of you men have, have had this conversation with pastor because he likes to do this. He likes to, he doesn't like to just make a decision on something that, that needs to be done. He likes to talk to people, get their advice, get their thoughts on it. And uh, so many, many times, on many occasions, he sat down with me and he said, look, this is something that's going on. Uh, you know, here's what I think I'm going to do about it. And I'm just thinking, man, if it was me, I would have jumped the gun and done that five days ago. But he wants to be careful because he's not a lord over God's heritage. He just wants to do what is right, and try to keep the flock together. And the first thing he's going to do when he, when he has a problem is get up in the pulpit and preach and feed the flock. Preach against whatever it is that, that problem is that's spreading throughout the church. The first thing, and that's what the Bible says you ought to do. Some people want him to go, you know, just go to that person and say, get out of the church. That's not the job of the pastor. Someone says, well, there's church discipline. There is, that's a separate thing. You can check that out in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 if you'd, if you'd like. That's for people who, are, who the church no longer believes are saved. They're so, so far gone. Uh, they're in a fornication. They're, in, they're, in, they're, thie they're thieves or whatever it is. And there's a list of things, 1 Corinthians 5. And that's not something that the pastor is commanded to do, by the way. That's the church that's commanded to do that. The pastor leads the church in it because he leads the church. That's not something the pastor is supposed to do. So here's that picture that we often think of of, of leadership, right? Leaders of men. They're, they're these strong, powerful people, right? That they're just going to come in and take over. And God says, no. For the pastor, he feeds the flock. He's an example. And he watches out for them. That's the pastor's job. And this, it's, this, it's this humility here now for a pastor who no longer feels like everything... Is, is revolving around him, and this is his ministry, right? 
And now it's, it's got to be, no, it's, it's God's ministry. And I'm just trying to do everything I can to feed that flock, to watch out for them. You know, and, and to be an example. And this is our pastor. I, I'm so grateful for that. So grateful for that. Now, verse 4. When the chief shepherd shall appear, ye, sh- ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. This is said specifically to the pastors, but I think, we'll, as we'll see in a moment, that it also applies to all members of the church who can receive this crown of glory. Right? But here's something to think about. How many churches across this country are people st- talking about their pastor behind his back, you know, saying things, whatever, oh, I, you know, bad mouth in the preacher? How ashamed will they be if they get to heaven and see Jesus say, you were wrong, here's the crown of glory to your pastor? You know? Well, I wanted my pastor to do more about this or to do more about that. Did he feed the flock? Right? Did he feed the flock? Did he, did he watch out for the people in the flock? Did, was, he, was he an example of the things he was teaching? Yeah. Well, then he's getting the crown of glory according to 1 Peter 5. And shame on us if we're going to try to badmouth a man who, uh, who God says is getting the crown of glory. Now, I don't think there's anybody in this church who, who's done that. But, but man... Watch where, how this now applies to the flock. Okay, so the first thing was a humility of the shepherd. Now the humility of the sheep. Look at this. Likewise, likewise, in the same way that the pastor does this and, and humbles himself in the position of leadership, which is really hard to do, be humble and also lead, you know? Just as the pastor humbles himself in a position of leadership, so likewise, ye younger... Submit yourselves unto the elder. Now, he's using the word younger here as sort of a contrast with that word elder. Because he's already used the word elder, and he's actually still using the word elder to speak about the presbytery or, or the, the clergy, the, the pastor. right? And he's saying, you younger, which, which means those of you who are not an elder, like everyone else in the church. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Unless someone think, well, that's just talking about young people who have to submit themselves to the pastor. No, yea, all of you be subject to one another. All of you be subject to one another. That's tough. That's tough. You ever see Mr. Mrs. Hunter, you know, sitting over here? And she, she'll just start talking to one of the little kids and, you know, tell them a story or something like that. What is she doing? She's submitting herself to a younger, trying to just help somebody out. And you ever see a, a teenager walk with Mrs. Hunter out to her car? What's that? The younger submitting to the older, right? This is, this is the church. You know, we are not about lifting ourselves up. We're about sacrificing our wants, sacrificing what we need, sacrificing what we desire, For someone else who needs something. We submit to one another. This is what the church is. And and this is not easy to do because of one word, and it's pride. And look at what it says. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed in humility. Clothed with humility. Here's the reason why we we don't care so much about submitting to certain people, right? Because they rub us the wrong way. They did me wrong. And they probably actually did. They probably actually did do something wrong, say something that's incorrect, act in a way that's just inappropriate. But the reason that we now hold that against that person Because we have no humility. We don't see ourselves for who we are. Like, right? We like, to, we like to hold everyone else to this standard. And just, we're never going to apply that standard to our lives. Because that would look really bad. Right? Forget how, who I am and, and what I've done to people. And the, and the mistakes and the failures that I've made. Forget all of that. No, no, no. Let's hold everyone to this high standard except for me. And that will give me good reason 
to say, no, I shouldn't submit to them because they did that, and I shouldn't submit to them, and I shouldn't. No, no, no. In the church, we all submit to each other, all submitting to one another. You know, whatever you need, I will sacrifice everything I have or everything that I want because you need something. That's the mindset of the church. But it doesn't happen most, in most churches because we aren't clothed in humility. Humility. Man, just, just saying, you know, I, I know you said that. I know, I know they did that. But, you know, I've done a lot worse. And, you know, God has saved me from a lot worse than that. And, you know, for that reason, don't let it go. Don't let it go. We're just going to be clothed in humility. What a difference humility makes in the church. When we start seeing ourselves for who we really are. Look, we're earthen vessels. You know, some people say it would be great if I could see the world the way God sees the world. Why don't you start by seeing yourself the way God sees you? Here's what God says about us. We, are, we have a treasure, but it's in earthen vessels. You know, we have value in Christ because we have Christ in us. And Christ is the value. But the vessel itself, us, we're just earthen vessels of no value at all except for what's contained within us. Right? And when we start seeing ourselves the way God sees us, boy, that will change everything. Humility. Clothed in humility. Watch what it says. For God resisteth the proud. You know, you can stand in the pulpit and preach a message. You could be reading your Bible. You could do whatever it is that you're doing that's holy and just. And do it with pride and God's resisting you. But he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. You're not placing yourself below someone else in the church by humbling yourself. No, you're placing yourself under the mighty hand of God. The mighty hand of God. That He may exalt you in due time. This is why I think that all believers will receive that crown of glory. So just as, just as Peter mentioned at the beginning of the passage, I'm going to be a partaker of that glory that shall be revealed. And then he says, the pastors, if they'll uh, submit in humility and, and just humble themselves, then they are also going to get the crown of glory. And now, also, the, the sheep of the church, as they clothe themselves in humility, they will also be exalted by the Lord in due time. They will also receive a crown of glory. Verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. We have to understand that people are people. Right? And a lot of times the reason that somebody did something wrong to you is because they have pain. They have hurt. They're hurt on the inside. And they're lashing out or acting out or whatever. And now we're hurt. And we're going to lash out back at them, right? And there's going to be this back and forth and back and forth. And guess what happens to the church? Split down the middle. What we need is to cast our cares on the Lord. He cares for me. I'm not expecting anything back from you when I submit to you. I'm not expecting anything in return. No, God's caring for me. I'm going to try to care for you. I'm just going to submit to you in love and humility because God's going to take care of me. Watch what it says. Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the person sitting next to you in church. <laughs> no, no. Here's your adversary devil we get our eyes off of the real enemy and on to each other what is the devil trying to do he's as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour you know what that means if i'm the one devouring other members of the church then i'm on the devil's team I'm a wolf, right? Here's what the devil wants to do. He wants to get us to just devour each other. He just wants us to devour each other. That's it. Little things creep in. We just want to slowly but surely. Boy, I wish that person wasn't in this church anymore. 
my goodness. No, 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 no. We have that same desire in our hearts should be as the shepherd does. And that is, let's keep them in here. Let's, let's see what we can do to go after them. Let's get them. Let's, let's help them. Let's, you know, what can we do? Right? Our heart is not the heart of Satan <laughs> to devour people. And yet, I wonder if, if the devil has used me to devour someone. Whom resist? <laughs> we're not resisting one another. We're resisting the devil. Whom resist steadfast in the faith? Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Our brothers and sisters in Christ are also in the same world that we are. And they're also facing the same temptations, the same afflictions, the same persecution of the devil that we are. But we can give ourselves excuse after excuse for our failures and our faults. But how many excuses do we give to our brothers and sisters in Christ who are facing the same things? You know? I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed of the times that I've not stop, stopped for a second and just thought that person that I felt like has done me wrong probably has felt the same way about me from time to time. Because we're all facing the same afflictions and persecutions. And by the way, even if I've never done that thing, whatever that thing is that I think that they, they've just gone too far now, I've done other things. I, I've failed in other areas. And the devil's after me, just like he's after them. And if I was... Humble enough to see who I was. A miserable failure, probably far worse than whoever it is I'm upset at. And I'd be able to submit to them, clothed in humility. That's why it says this. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. No one in this church is perfect yet. You know, we're not there yet. <laughs> and yet, even though we know this of ourselves, we expect it of others. You know, boy, I, I tell you what, the deacon ought to be perfect. Deacon's wife ought to be perfect. You know, the pastor ought to be perfect. The pastor's wife, you know, the Sunday school teacher ought to be perfect. No. No, we submit to what, not one another in humility. We understand, look, they're facing the same kind of things that I face. And they fall just as much, sometimes more, sometimes less than I fall. And we're failures. We all are. But here's what happens when the devil has his way and we don't have the humility that we ought to have. Because this is point number three. It's not just the humility of the shepherd and the humility of the sheep. It's the glory of God. The glory of the Savior. Because don't think that this crown of glory is something that we just hold on to and keep. Look what it says in verse 12. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Revelation chapter 4. This is neat. In Revelation chapter 4, the Apostle John is, sees this scene in heaven. And it says... Um, that he, he was in the Spirit, he was in the throne room in heaven. Verse 4, round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders, sitting clothed in white raiment. That's Christian people. We're, we're promised white robes in heaven. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. They'd been to the judgment seat of Christ. They've been given a crown. Look what it says in verse 10. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever. And cast their crowns before the throne. Saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory 
and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You see, we don't, we don't humble ourselves in the church because we want to receive a crown of glory that glorifies us. No, no, God gives us the crown of glory so that we can cast it at His feet. And I can imagine, this isn't Scripture, I just imagine, you know, the Lord one day saying, you know, I saw, I saw that. You know those times when, when inside you wanted, to, you wanted to lash out, inside you wanted to just fight back, inside you felt like you had been mistreated by another believer. And in humility, you submitted. You cared for them more than you cared for you. I saw that. Here's the crown of glory. Just imagine that. And then, after he's gone through all the, all the names of those who received the crown, and we're all standing there around the throne, we're all looking at this crown and thinking, this, uh, I don't deserve that. I don't deserve that. And then, with every bit of strength we have from wherever we are in that throne room, we cast it at his throne. And we say, you're worthy. You're the one who's worthy for the glory. God help me if I don't have a crown to cast. Because I lived my life for my glory, not for His. And I'm torn apart about this idea that, that not only must I submit to others and give grace to others in the church, who, 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 fall, who, have, who have faults and who fail miserably. But I, I'm torn apart about this fact that there are probably many, many, many people in this church who have already given grace to me. I, I may have said something that I, I don't even know what it was. I wouldn't even remember it. But man, it really, it really hurt. And I was being used of the devil to hurt you. And I wonder, after all the times that people have given grace to me, all the times that I've done something that should have, you know, cut me off from fellowship, and here I am, what responsibility I have to give grace to others. But not, not because I love you all, though I love you. <laughs> Not because I love the sheep. Not because I love the pastor. You know? But for the glory of God. We don't submit to one another because of each other. Because then we won't submit to one another. Because it doesn't matter who you're talking about. Whether it's from the pastor to the deacon to everybody down the list, right? Um, you're going to stop submitting as soon as they make the mistake. We submit for the glory of of God, and for the glory of God alone. Father in heaven, thank you for stirring up my own heart about this. God, help us to have a church clothed in humility. Help us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. So that you may exalt us in due time and we can use that exaltation and that glory for your glory as well. Forgive us for the pettiness that we often hold in our hearts one against another. And God, I pray that you would see fit to lead us all in a manner of life that would lead us to that final moment at the throne room where we receive the crown of glory to cast it at your feet. For you are worthy to receive the glory and the honor and the power. For you have created all things and for your pleasure they are and were created. 